I'm gonna read a couple things that the Jeff wrote that are dear to me for all different types of reasons. We'll take turns just like we do every week. Um, yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and do these poems now before I can. about religion all the time and how, in our opinion, Christians were a bunch of bullies. Um, and then something very specific happened and he wrote me this. And it says, I don't think you understand God as well as you say you do. See, that's sort of why I have trouble with the whole shebang, the entire concept. How a divine power allows a piece of shit like you to walk around wearing his name like a football jersey. You're able to mock my brother because you have no earthly idea what it takes for him to walk outside. For any of us to make it past the fucking door on any given day, you might think that means we need Jesus. No. You need Jesus. We have each other. Jeff only performed this poem twice in this room. The second time because I asked him to please do it so I could finally videotape it. And I spent a good part of the afternoon rewinding the tape and making sure I could write it all down. Um, he wrote this one for us, Benny. These walls stained with harsh blood, tear pocked and streaked with rage, marked by heavenly thunder, these walls will one day fade, and no one will remember. No one will remember the war we fought here for the sacred, for the profane, for the profound. These walls will fall, these bricks will crumble into weeds and blow away, and we'll all turn to dust. This house will fall. Even now, as we raise it with words under a judgmental sky, strewn among stardust and night's fiery passion, this house is falling. Even now, I have seen that, and I know it to be true. I have walked the halls of Voltaire, of the Palladium, and the West End with Didi and John and Malcolm, and they are gone. I have loved in Casablanca with Bailey and Kathleen, with Joshua and with the Snow White. I've broken bread with the procrastinator poet, shared a summer wine with Maxwell and Angela and Sarah. I have loved the poet's love, deep in thought, underneath Kerouac's star, and they are all gone. I have journeyed on a safari with God's child and the queen, and through the kingdom with DeAndre, traded blows with the Marquis of Thirteen, toured the serious bane of thunder with Roxanne and Nakia and Janice and good King Tutankhamen. I propagated mighty omens upon the next stage. Who remembers now? The street poets, Robert and Richard with his 500 foot Jesus Re of Rio de Janeiro and Bradley heckling the diet, mad doctor of verse and Arthur and Delaney and so many more I have forgotten. The streets are no longer there. Their signs faded and empty, scattered into the four winds. So write for now. Live for now, breathe and weep and scream for now, because the future is ash upon ash, and the venue we take fellowship in tonight will one day die. No matter how much we love these walls, no matter what great deeds we commit upon its memories, these bonds will fade, and there will come a day when no one will remember any of or any of our works. So write for now. Live for now and nothing more, and perhaps we might live on in others if we emulate the secret paths of humility and grace. Perhaps the wind will one day whisper soft into new ears. I was there with George and ES 
and Leanne, and Casey, and Bane, and Jamel, and Buddy, and Kaja, and Seven, and Patty, and Taz, and the rest too numerous to mention, I was there at the venue. Do you remember? I'm going to leave you with uh, one last thing from him, and you probably won't see a whole lot of me for the rest of the night, unless I'm introducing people. Again, thank you all for being here uh, in the spirit of the venue feel whatever you feel. There's a reason we say the expression feel things out. You have to, you have to feel it out. Um, the more you internalize, the unhappier you'll get. That's something that I had to learn the hard way. So you're among friends, you're among family, so it's okay to be hurt in here, okay? Jeff says, I believe that all points of time exist simultaneously. It's just that we're only capable of experiencing it linearly. I take comfort in this, knowing that those who are gone are still here in a way. So for everyone coming up here tonight, um, be patient with yourself. We'll be patient with you. And uh, be thankful for the stage that we're on, because we owe it to you. Right. So our, uh, our first person coming up to share this evening is our sister, CJ Expression. I'm one of the many poets, but more importantly, I was part of the Dear Broken Woman Project. And Jeff took it upon himself that first afternoon of filming to come out and capture the moments. And they are some of the best pictures that I have of any of it. He was so talented. And we're going to miss him. But I say this. Jeff Hewitt, you are such a presence. I use present tense because you are still very much alive in the minds, hearts, pens, lenses, and guitar riffs of all of those who have had the pleasure to know you. You live in our nuances turn of phrases, lyrics, and our photo galleries, which you've influenced heavily. You live in the creek of the venue stage where you stood right here, encouraging, challenging, and inspiring so many others. You live in the feature set photos and the concert archives you helped capture. You live in your children's smirks and knowing gazes, in how they will challenge the world as they carve themselves a place within it. You live in every kindness, we show our pets the way you catered to Muppet. And when we, was, when we witness beauty in everyday walking around scenery. You live in the way we will question politics, demand better governance, and lobby for the arts to remain in the school curriculum, guided by past conversations with you and the example you set. You live in the breath of our words as we speak tolerance and love. You live in the way we will ask one another and new poets on the scene, who are you reading? The lucky ones will get many stories about the man behind that phrase. You live in so many ways that past tense in reference to you doesn't exist. You reside in the now, witnessed in the ways that encompass us all your legacy too immense to be merely physical and trapped in a 24-hour cycle. Your hugs and smile will be missed and craved deeply, but you will be very much alive. This New Year's Eve you said, I believe that all points of time exist simultaneously. It's just that we're only capable of experiencing it linearly. I take great comfort in this knowing that those who are gone are still here in a way. <coughs> and you are wise, which tells me that belief is true. So tonight, with our family bonds stronger than blood, as we gather together and grieve the loss of your physical presence, 
you are here with us, among us, in peace, in love, and in wonder. Thank you, CJ. One more time for CJ Benjamin. Just now getting a good look at this list. <laughs> uh, I couldn't get a list as good at open mic, but here we are. A <laughs> man. And speaking of that, please help me welcome to the stage, Bill Gross. So I'm not reading anything tonight. I just wanted to uh, say a few words. Um, I I travel around the state filming events and. At so many of them, Jeff would be there in the wings taking photographs. Uh, he was great at that, of taking photos of people when they didn't realize that anybody was shooting and then sharing them with them, the photos that would end up being their bio photos. They were so good. Uh, likewise, he was also uh, with San Francisco Bay Press from the beginning and many poets here have been uh, published by them and many of you i'm sure have had the same experience as me i, I had two books published by san, san francisco bay press and he made the covers for both of these and in each instance i had my own idea for the cover and i gave him photos and what i thought it should be and he came back to me with something that was so much better <laughs> he knew what i wanted <clears throat> when I didn't know what I wanted and and that's what he did for everyone else uh, also uh, with the poetry society um, he has been one of the champions of inclusivity uh, dragging the old guard <laughs> And, and I'm one of those who are so poor with the digital world. And uh, so Jeff and I had many battles, and fortunately, he won all of those. Uh, he, uh, he was a great man that touched so many lives. And just looking around the audience here when I talk about you know, how he fought for inclusivity, this crowd is just a perfect representation of Jeff's heart. So thank you. So I'm sure everyone in here can attest to the fact that Jeff's reputation kind of preceded him. Um, and especially in the poetry community, we are all very much well aware that this poetry community would not exist without him, literally. A lot of times we say things because they sound sweet, but those are just those are just the God honest facts. So I, I had heard his name a lot before I finally got to meet him. He had been away from the mic for a while, and I had only been hosting maybe a, maybe a year, maybe a little over a year. So he comes in, and I, I didn't know what he looked like. And Patty Ray, who was the owner of, of the venue at the time, make some noise if you remember Patty. Yeah! She pulls me aside and she's like, hey, this is Jeff Hewitt, he, he'd like to perform. And I'm like, okay, he can go sign up. And she's like, no, you think you can just kind of like, maybe, so I was like, no. <laughs> Absolutely not. Like, I don't care who you are, Pope, Jesus, Ayatollah Khomeini, you gotta wait, just like everybody else. Nobody in here is better than anybody at all. Um, and in true Jeff fashion, he went home and posted about it. So, <laughs> And he couldn't tag me because we weren't friends yet, so he tagged the venue. Um, but it was, it was such a, it was such a beautiful kick in the face. Um, Cause he, he was, he, he was thankful that all these years later, what really mattered at the end of the day is what you spit into this microphone when you come to the open mic here. It's not, there's, there's no there's no special treatment for anybody. Nobody gets to jump in front of anybody in line. Nobody gets more time than anyone else. Um, and he respected that. And from that grew a brotherhood. Um, yeah. All right. 
That being said, and speaking of brotherhood, please help me welcome to the stage JT Williams. I met Jeff at Casablanca Cafe. Uh, we spent a lot of time talking about poets and poetry. A lot of people that were in here we talked about. Uh, I've been thinking all day, if there's an afterlife, I really hope he's pissing somebody off. <laughs> So in a lot of these alcohol fueled sessions, the name that kept coming up over again is Charles, Charles Bukowski. And despite his problems as a human being, Jeff said the man could fucking break a line. So I'm going to read something from Bukowski for Jeff. And it's something I always hear in Jeff's voice. And it sounds like it could have been written for yesterday. Born like this, into this, as the chalk faces smile, as Mrs. Death laughs, as the elevators break, as political landscapes dissolve, as the supermarket bag boy holds a college degree, as the oily fish spit out their oily prey, as the sun is masked. We are born like this, into this, into these carefully mad wars, into the sight of broken factory windows of emptiness, into bars where people no longer speak to each other, into fist fights that end as shootings and knifings. Born into this, into hospitals which are so expensive it's cheaper to die, into lawyers whose charge is so much it's cheaper to plead guilty, into a country where the jails are full and the madhouses closed, into a place where the masses elevate fools into rich heroes. Born into this, walking and living through this, dying because of this, muted because of this, castrated, debauched, disinherited because of this, fooled by this, used by this, pissed on by this, made crazy and sick by this, made violent, made inhuman by this. The heart is blackened, the fingers reach for the throat, the gun, the knife, the palm, the fingers reach for an unresponsive God. The fingers reach for the bottle, the pill, the powder. We are born into this sorrowful deadliness. We are born into a government 60 years in debt that soon will be unable to even pay the interest on that debt. And the banks will burn. Money will be useless. There will be open and unpunished murder in the streets. It will be guns and roving mobs. Land will be useless. Food will become a diminishing return. Nuclear power will be taken over by the many. Explosions will continually shake the earth. Radiated robot men will stalk each other. The rich and the chosen will watch from space platforms. Dante's Inferno will be made to look like a children's playground. Mm -hmm. The sun will not be seen and it will always be night. Trees will die. All vegetation will die. Radiated men will eat the flesh of radiated men. The sea will be poisoned. The lakes and rivers will vanish. Rain will be the new gold. The rotting bodies of men and animals will stink in the dark wind. The last few survivors will be overtaken by new and hideous diseases. The space platforms will be destroyed by attrition. The petering out of supplies. The natural effect of general decay. And there will be the most beautiful silence never heard. Born out of that, the sun is still hidden there, awaiting the next chapter. Up next, please help me welcome Dave Putman. I met Jeff probably about nine years ago at the Muse, the old Muse Center in Chelsea, just a few blocks from where I was living. And dug his poetry, he dug my music. Friends ever since. Here's a song I have never memorized, because I don't sing it that often. I sing it at memorials, like this. Uh, I did sing it. Sky knew my late partner, Susan Garvey, and our daughter, Sarah, used to babysit Sky. <clears throat> I sang this to Sue about 20 minutes before she died in the hospital. And Sarah was singing to her when she died. 
This is by the late great Phil Oakes, another poet who died way too young. There's no place in this world where I belong when I'm gone. And I won't know the right from the home when I'm gone And you won't find me singing on the song when I'm gone So I guess I'll have to do it while I'm here I won't feel the flow another time when I'm gone All the pleasures of love will not be mine when I'm gone my pen won't pour out a lyric line when I'm gone So I guess I'll have to do it while I'm here I won't breathe the bracing air when I'm gone And I can't even worry about my cares when I'm gone I won't be asked to do my share when I'm gone so I guess I have to do it while I'm here I won't be running from the rain when I'm gone Can't even suffer from the pain when I'm gone There's nothing I can lose or gain when I'm gone So I guess I'll have to do it while I'm here Won't see the golden of the sun when I'm gone In the evenings and the mornings there'll be one when I'm gone Can't sing louder than the guns when I'm gone So I guess I'll have to do it while I'm here Days won't be dances of delight when I'm gone. And the sands will be shifting from the sight when I'm gone. Can I add my name to the fight when I'm gone? So I guess I'll have to do it while I'm here. And I won't, I won't be laughing at the lies. When I'm gone, can't question how or when or why or when I'm gone. Can't live proud enough to die when I'm gone. So I guess I'll have to do it while I'm here. There's no place in this world where I belong when I'm gone. I won't know the right from the wrong when I'm gone. You won't find me singing on this song when I'm gone So I guess I'll have to do it I guess I'll have to do it I guess I'll have to do it While I'm here Thank you, Thank you Jeff, you did it while you were here, damn it! This next item is actually a bit of a bucket list item for me. I get to introduce this man to the venue stage. Please welcome venue, Mr. Bob Arthur. because of our newspaper man who wrote an article on the local arts and he said there the best two poets in this area were Bob Arthur and Jeff Hewitt. <laughs> I didn't know Jeff Hewitt, he didn't know Bob Arthur. I was teaching a class on poetry about six months later and Jeff had 
finally figured out I was a teacher, knew where I was te teaching. And he came to my class and pretended to be a student who had signed up for the class. <laughs> and I, I pegged him for you know some sort of ringer, especially when I called the roll. He wasn't on it. And I said, who are you? And he said, Jeff Hewitt. And I said, oh, God, I'll be looking for that guy. <laughs> I don't care whether he's paid or not. He's staying in my damn class. <laughs> so he stayed in my class. I cheated, cheated the college out of all that tuition. And I guess we've been great friends for 30 years or so. And we started the San Francisco Big Press together. <laughs> had to drop out at a certain point because as you see I'm old <laughs> and Jeff wasn't wasn't old you know I wish he had gotten older well Jeff and I in all that time never really wrote with each other we never wrote a poem together you would think that we would have and when I was about to retire last year uh, I was you know, I was the president of the Poetry Society of Virginia, and I, I was going to retire. So I had to have some sort of resignation speech. So I thought I would write a poem. So I told him about it, and I tried to write it, and I couldn't write it. And he started helping me. So we worked on it, really, for a long, long time. I mean, over days, because it's a very delicate little thing, and it's, it's nothing, but it was hard to write for some reason. So this is really, was written by both Jeff and me. And the reason I'm reading it now is not just because it was written by both Jeff and me, it's because it was perfect fit for my retirement, and it's a perfect fit for now. This is called To the Poet, Pausing. Go on, ignore the licks of roughened tongue, roughened, roughened tongues, even the wrong path can lead you home. Past the torn sail and the bloodied horn, beyond love's ache. He's... I changed my glasses. <laughs> I don't have to have I get on stage and I can't see and I have to change my eyes. Something's going on, with, something's going on in my head. But I've got to start over. Because I've already ruined it, I'm not going to see it. Again. Take two. Take two. Take two. Take three. I'm going to hold it closer. Go on, ignore the licks of roughened tongues. Even the wrong path can lead you home. Past the torn sail and the bloodied horn, beyond love's aches that erupt for two Go on. The silent are watching, their eyes like stones. Even the weeping winds can blow you home. Go on, go on. Above the ages scribbling in bone, your poems will write themselves. Go on, when dark skies howl to the jackal moon, and you are dying alone. Even old world, old words will fly you home. Next, please help me welcome Susan Foster. Susan told me that she uh, put her name down because she knew I was going to be late. She's like, when he calls my name, it's going to be you. <laughs> so here I am, and um, if you don't know me, my name is Angela Harrison Ang. And uh, Bob was just talking about how he was. Uh, that Hewitt was in a class with him, and I was the student that brought Hewitt to his class. <laughs> um, I met Jeff when I was 18, and I I had a government teacher that had to have, like, so he was having some sort of folk festival thing, and he's like, do any of you know anybody who plays music? And I thought about it at the cafe. I was like, there's this dude that plays music. But he's really freaking scary. <laughs> I was absolutely terrified of that man, I will tell you. And at 18, I was just like, uh, 
hey, um, there's this thing that my government teacher is doing, and he's like, who the hell are you? <laughs> but he actually played at that event, and he actually, uh, after that, we got to be friends. And we went through a lot together. And we had a lot of ups and downs. And, and uh, so I drove down from D.C. today with one of my friends, because that's where I live now. And um, last night, I absolutely tore apart my house because I did this Marie Kondo thing where I got rid of a whole bunch of crap. And then I couldn't find anything. And finally, at some point in the middle of the night, I got my hands on this box that was buried in the corner of the guest room, and I, I found treasure. And if you don't know what this is, this was a chapbook that he put out in 2001. <laughs> he said that I probably have one of the only existing copies left. Um, and in fact, when I opened it and looked at the dedication line, it says, when I die, I want them to stuff me full of C4 and mail me to someone I <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know if we could, you know, find a way to send it to the White House. And I, I decided that if I did get up enough nerve to read tonight, anything at all, and thanks to Susan, I didn't have a choice. Thank you, Susan. Um, that I was. <laughs> <laughs> that I was going to read something from this book. And I really don't feel like I could do any of these justice because there's so many good poems in here. And I'm sure that there are so many good poems that so many of you know. Um, I'm not him. And I don't know that I could, like I said, do it justice. but. One that always meant a lot to me it was a very short one, and I really hope I can get through this. Um, it's called Training Wheels. And she's the angel of death on training wheels. Leaving me impotent before her grace. I fake the death of my heart each moment in her presence. Desperate to avoid the annihilation of my reserve. I love you too. So I, I could probably stand up here all night and tell stories, but there's other people that we have yet to hear from, so. Thank you. Let's keep that applause going, please, for Josh Weinstein. My name is Josh, and like a lot of people in this room, I met Jeff at Casablanca Cafe. As I was uh, standing here earlier, watching uh, everybody file in, um, and recognizing people from the past, from Casablanca, uh, I caught myself more than once waiting for Jeff to walk in. Those are the people that come in before Jeff comes in or after Jeff comes in, and so he should be coming any minute. Um, and that happened more than once. Um, I have a list of about five different things that I was supposed to follow up with Jeff on uh, in the next couple weeks. Um, just um, 
you know, things like, uh, he, you know, help my, run my website. And so he would help me edit things that I was writing. We had, you know, uh, a friendship. And I had these things stacked up. They were, you know, items I wanted to talk to him about for uh, weeks. Sometimes uh, a few of them were months behind. And, um, and I was wondering today why I had waited so long, too late at that, uh, to talk to Jeff about these things. And it's because I always thought Jeff was going to outlive everyone in this room. I always thought he was going to outlive everyone. Um, and that's because he put so much into this life that he deserved to outlive everyone. Uh, with his, you know, all of his grit and his, and his talent and his, and his kindness, um, he just, he put so much into it and, um, uh, you know, I just always thought that he would get a little more out of it. Um, I, uh, I, I used to read at the open mics at Casablanca, um, and then also at 40th Street stage. I wasn't very good, but, uh, Jeff made me do it anyway, um, encouraged me to get on the stage, um, uh, even though I was terrified and I wasn't good at it. Um, and um, he did that for a lot of people. Not the terrible and not good at part, but he, he encouraged, he fostered so much talent in other people. Um, I was just always amazed that uh, he had a bottomless uh, well of creativity, not only in his own projects, but in those around him. He could put in time and effort and consideration and editing and suggestions and mentoring in, in just about everyone he knew. Um, I never really heard of him saying, you know, somebody came up to me and they needed help and I, I told him to fuck off. You know? <laughs> I never heard him say something like that. Um, or even have that type of spirit in him. Um, unless he didn't like him, and that was a completely different story. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, assuming that they were neutral or better, he would, you know, give them the time of day. Um, and, uh, you know, I always felt pretty honored even to be on the same open mic stage, which there was a very low bar for that, of course, uh, at uh, Casablanca. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, you know, at Casablanca, you know, in general. Well, they call it open for a reason. Uh, so, anyway, no, the point, the point back, back here, the point is, um, I was always honored to be on the same stage as him, um, and, uh, you know, I never got to read anything here, um, and I always wanted to, and I wish I had before tonight. Um, and um, so, I too, uh, Angela, who's a tough uh, uh, person to follow, um, I too uh, went through my archives and was looking for uh, chat books or um, something of Jeff's that um, would bring back some memories or uh, maybe um, some of his old poetry, because not a lot of it, his old poetry is online, um, if any. Um, so if you want to read it, really, uh, these chat books are it, um, for the most part. <clears throat> so, um, I, I looked everywhere and I only found one, um, that, um, didn't really have the poem that I wanted to read tonight. Uh, so I grabbed my old desktop, uh, out of the attic. I took it down and I had to buy a keyboard. I bought a keyboard. <laughs> I bought a keyboard today at a thrift store for you, Jeff. Uh, I asked the guy where the keyboard was, and, he, and, the keyboard, and he was like, you mean for a computer? <laughs> for a computer. Um, so anyway, the keyboard and this poem are for you, Jeff. Uh, and um, I found it on uh, my desktop in the archives, a text file document. For some reason, I had a text file document of a bunch of... Jeff's poetry that probably 15 years ago I was going to try to pass off on my, as my own or um, I, and um, so I went through them and uh, I found the one that I wanted to read luckily as, as Angela said I found treasure um, so uh, this one is called Leviathan oh, yeah. Yeah, it's a good one and uh, again I, I don't think I'll be able to do it justice but I'll, I'll do my best <clears throat> We are all so very small, she declared, as if the statement were incontrovertible, undeniable, and obvious truth. But what if she's wrong? What if we are vast? And how does one measure existence? And what yardstick a life? On what scale a soul? What if we are vast? Incalculable in magnitude, 
Leviathans atop an impossible sea, colossal and looming. What if the universe is but our mere shadow, light, our sight, sound, the footprint of our passing? What if we give meaning to this ever-expanding universe, purpose to each contraction, breath to each subtraction? What if our entirety is the division by which the parliament of stars is legislated, each of our minds a single vote tallied and set forth as the quorum which makes what is, is? What if we are vast? What if existence is an ever-unfolding tragic comedy, intricate in plot, like the tiny facets of a little piece of rain, diverse in character, unfolding the set on which we are not the players, but the played upon, the audience, the patrons, whose favor is so necessary that the show might go on? What if we are vast? For if we might conceive of greatness, can we not be great? And we can conceive of infinity, might we not become infinite? And if we can conceive of omniscience, is it not possible that we may already know all there is to know and have forgotten, forgotten, have forgotten the answers, the questions, and all that lies between? What if we have but to conceive and believe that we are gods, that it might be so? What if our dreams are unfinished contracts with the reality, unwitting promises upon which everything is leveraged? What if hope is not may, but will? Would we but will it so? Thank you. That's one of the uh, first poems I ever heard from Jeff. The very first poem, the one he did that night that I almost didn't let him on the list was Bang. <laughs> you want to talk about sucking the air out of the room. I don't know how many of us went home and burned entire notebooks that night. I, like, I quit. I can't do this. All right. Um, please help me welcome to the stage my brother Christopher Austin. That is Taz, and I'm going to marry her one day. She doesn't, she doesn't know it yet, but we're going to have very beautiful children. Not with that shirt on. Uh, with that shirt This shirt is the most attractive thing about me. <laughs> Jeff would have been mad at me if I didn't wear this shirt. The first time he, he ever saw this shirt, which I made online because I was just like, that would be fucking funny. Uh, I wore it into Cafe Stella, which is where I first met Jeff, and I can't remember the first time I did because he was just always there. Yeah. Uh, the first time he saw this shirt, he looked at it, and he took a second, and he didn't stop laughing for five minutes. And if you know Jeff, you know his laugh. Big mouth just can't stop, close to tears. Um, I didn't prepare anything to read, but there are some things. There's a... Uh, one of the poems that George read from from Jeff uh, used the phrase, you know, was the phrase profane, uh, profane and profound. Um, and I'm more profane than profound. I'm not a super deep person. Uh, but last night I was at Kogan's. A bunch of people got together at Kogan's to just get fucking smashed for Jeff. And, uh, I drink so much that I feel like you would have been proud of me where everyone else should be concerned. Uh, now, while I was 10 or 12 or 14 beers deep, uh, and many of you probably read the article online, this is uh, this is just the clip that they had of me, and this is, this is going to be fun. Christopher Austin candidly... Oh, shit, my phone turned off. <laughs> candidly described his relationship with Hewitt. He said the pair disagreed quite a bit, but there was one thing they both agreed on. If something happened to either of them, they wouldn't want anyone to sugarcoat the type of people they were. This is this is the this is the quote they used for uh, he used for me. He was very opinionated. Austin said he was very forward. He was the kind of guy who would let you know what he believed every step of the way. And that's the nicest quote he could find for me in that entire drunken. <laughs> uh, so you know I don't. I don't want to upset anybody, but Jeff was kind of a dickhead, and I love him. <laughs> uh, and this, not to, not to, uh, not to make this any sort of sob story about me, but it's necessary for me to tell you what kind of person Jeff was. I had a mental break about a year and a half ago, and I didn't talk to anybody. I stayed home. I became a raging alcoholic. Uh, and one day I snuck out of the house to come down to Yorgos 
to get to get you know they have some banging fucking vegan breakfast stuff. <laughs> so I was walking. I was in the parking lot behind Yorgos, and then up up rolls the moped. And I noticed it's Jeff, so I, and I hadn't seen him in seven, eight months. And he said, hi, how's it going? And because I'm always candid, I said, not very well, Jeff. Like, my brain is not working correctly. And the only thing he said to me, well, you're still alive. That's what counts. He just fucking banned. <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't want to have a conversation about it. He was like, fuck this, I'm out. <laughs> and um, we would often sit out on the patio of Cafe Stella, and he would drink his coffee, and I would rack up $100 tabs for beer, and we would argue about anything, things we agreed on. <laughs> vicious arguments. We were not nice to each other. See, like, everybody has such amazing, nice things to say about Jeff Hewitt, and I love him for it, but again, he could be quite a dickhead. <laughs> And it's kind of like a relationship you, you have with a brother, where you don't have to like him all the time, but you always love him. Uh, just a few days ago, I spent time with Taz, who, again, I'm going to marry and make beautiful babies with. Uh, and we were, we were talking, I, I, I'm a, I, I drive for Uber and Lyft, and... I got, I got a Lyft request and it said Taz in Portsmouth. And I don't go to Portsmouth, but I said, I only know one Taz in Portsmouth. So like I clicked it and then I called. She, she what, what did she say? She said, uh, well, are you already here? That was pretty fast. And I was like, is this really Taz? And she's like, yeah. And I'm like, you know, I dropped your last name. And she's like, how do you know my last name? And I was like, this is your Uber driver, Christopher Austin. And Taz is someone I, I haven't seen in God knows how long. So I went and I picked her up and I took her for a ride, which paid, she tipped me three dollars, by the way. So. Okay, I, told, I told her not to, so I got to get her back somehow. But we sat in the car in her parking, like I turned off my apps, I was no longer driving. I wasted, I wasted two hours sitting in the parking lot of her apartment. And we talked about anything and everything, and we talked about Jeff. And guess what? I didn't really have nice things to say. Because me and Jeff, we argue. We loved each other, and if... If I felt like I ever truly needed anything, he would be there. I once drove him to take his cat to the vet. I, I fucking, I, I don't, like I said, I don't have anything prepared, and some of the things that I'm saying might not be so nice, but Jeff wouldn't have it any other way. If Jeff could right now, he would come down and slap me in the fucking mouth if all I was saying was flowery nice things about him. Because that's not what Jeff wants. That's not that's not what Jeff would want on this stage. So I implore anyone speaking, anyone sharing, to share the real Jeff. Not that not that people haven't been. And you, everybody's been telling wonderful stories. Uh, Angela, is that your name? I'm so sorry. I did not know you. Um, just making sure she, you know, she said he was scary. She was telling her truth about Jeff. And everybody has such wonderful things to say. And I love you for it because you're all making me fucking cry. And that's not a good look wearing this shirt. But Jeff was Jeff. And we all fucking loved him. And that's why we're here. It's so great to be here on this stage, somewhere I haven't been in many years, and I'm here because of Jeff, and this stage is here because of Jeff. Yes. So, Jeff, Jeff is here, and I love everyone here for showing up, faces I don't know, faces I haven't seen in years, people that I will never see again. <laughs> Just thank you for being here. It means, it means a lot to all of us, and thank you for everyone who organized this. Thank you, that's my.